everyone. Hello. Um, my name is Bo Shin. Just call me Bo. My name is Bo Shin. Just call me Bo. Today I'm going to talk about a system that is a great way for molecular target validation. Uh, that is an effective antimicrobial delivery system, and it is a potential treatment of toxoplasma gonorrhea infections. So there are a few questions uh, embedded in this title of mere clarification. So what is toxoplasma gonorrhea? Uh, what does this system entail? And finally, how can one system um, do three things at once? Okay. So let's start off with toxoplasma gonorrhea, or toxo for short. Uh, Toxoplasma gondii is an obligate intracellular parasite, meaning that they must reside inside a host cell in order to replicate, in order to extract nutrient, and in order to uh, multiply, basically, and survive. So over here, we are seeing this parasite gliding toward this host cell menacingly and uh, actively invading the host cell. And um, Another interesting fact about Toxo is that it is one of the most prevalent parasites in the world. Uh, it, is, it infects over 2 billion people worldwide. That's over a third of the world's population, uh, including many of us here. Um, but <laughs> but I mean, don't worry about it because it's largely innocuous and healthy individuals like us. But if you are immunocompromised, so for example, if you have HIV or AIDS, uh, and you get infected with Toxo, that infection may become a full-blown disease state. And if you're a pregnant woman and you acquire this parasite for the first time while you're pregnant, uh, the parasite might be passed on to your fetus and your uh, fetus might get the uh, full-blown disease state of the parasite as a result. So how do we actually get the parasite? Well, there are three ways. Uh, the first way, and uh, the most common way, is through contaminated water and produce. The second way, uh, the second way uh, is by uh, ingesting uh, contaminated meat or undercooked meat with toxoplasma in there. And that's actually why more than 90% of French people have toxoplasma. And because, <laughs> because they just love their steak tartare. So uh, almost everyone in France has toxoplasma. <laughs> and while the parasite infects at all warm-blooded animals, the parasite has developed a special relationship with members of the Felidae family. And members of the Felidae families are commonly known as felines, or cats. Okay. And, and um, when they poo, they typically shed... <laughs> They typically shed billions and billions of toxoplasma gondii. And when the wind comes, the toxoplasma parasites become airborne. And if you breathe in the toxoplasma gondii, you get infected. And so if you're thinking of starting a family, or if you're pregnant and you have a cat at home, our suggestion for you would be to wear masks and gloves when you clean up cat litter. And avoid um, letting your cat outside to reduce exposure of your cat and yourself to Toxoplasma gondii. Okay. Okay. The disease caused by Toxoplasma gondii is called Toxoplasmosis, and uh, it affects the retina and choroid region of the eye, resulting in something called choroid retinitis. And so what we're seeing here is a developing scar caused by active parasite invasion. Uh, it, can also cause, uh, it can also cause a uh, neural uh, degradation and calcification in the brain. So all of the white dots that we're seeing here um, represent serious calcification in the brain. So it can cause mental retardation, and cause strokes, and a lot of terrible stuff. So um, an effective medication against toxoplasma must cross multiple physical barriers. So they must cross ocular membranes to get to where the parasites are at the back of the eyes. And they also must cross the important blood-brain barrier, separating our blood circulation and where the parasites are replicating in the brain. So that's the first challenge in treating toxoplasmosis, the physical barriers. The second uh, challenge is um, what are the essential targets? What are the essential genes for the parasites? So identifying those essential genes. 
The third problem in treating toxoplasmosis has to do with the toxicity and hypersensitivity of current drugs. So the gold standard for treating toxoplasmosis right now is the administration of pyrimethamine and sulfatizine. And that has some serious consequences in terms of toxicity and hypersensitivity. So we need a model that has low or uh, no toxicity and hypersensitivity at all. The last challenge in treating toxoplasmosis has to do with the effective parasite response to stress. So what do I mean by this? Well, there are actually two forms of the parasites. And uh, there's the active form of the parasites. This form is exceptionally virulent. So they are invading cells like crazy. But as our immune response uh, mounts attack uh, or respond to uh, parasite infections, uh, the parasites react to the external stress. So they wrap themselves in this thick layer of lipid so what we're seeing here is a cyst with hundreds of dormant sleeping parasites inside. And once they become dormant, they become impervious to the external stress, like our immune response, like nutrient starvation. And my favorite analogy is a tortoise crawling up into a shell and become impervious to external threat. That's my favorite analogy. Okay. So four challenges. The physical barriers imposed by the locations of the parasites, identifying essential targets for the parasites, reducing toxicity and hypersensitivity, and getting uh, those inhibitors across that thick layer of lipid uh, to where the dormant parasites are. So the four challenges. And we believe that this system is the answer. The transductive peptide-linked phosphorodiamide morpholine oligomers. What a mouthful. But uh, if we break down this monster right here, it's basically two components joined together. So for the first component, we have the transductive peptide. And for the second component, we have uh, morpholino for short. And so let's just tackle them one by one. Let's talk about morpholino first, and then we'll talk about transductive peptide. Morpholino is an inhibitory system. So you can use it to inhibit literally anything you want. As long as you know what your target is, you can inhibit that target. And uh, if we go back to biology 101, so DNA is transcribed into RNA, which is then translated into protein. Well, morpholino blocks the translation process, so you don't actually get protein product at the end. So that's the first component, the inhibitory component. The second component is a transductive component. Transductive peptides have been shown to be able to cross multiple membrane barriers. And uh, we believe they have the potential uh, to enter in cystic dormant bradyzoids in that thick layer of lipid that I was talking about. And we believe that transductive peptides can deliver cargoes and possible inhibitors to the eyes and to the brain. And when we join the two components together, it looks like this. So we have the morpholino end that's being linked to this big blob right here. And this is the cargo delivery vehicle. And we believe that that system can solve many, if not all, of these problems. Physical barriers, we can use it to identify essential targets. Uh, we believe it's a very stable system with low toxicity and hypersensitivity. And we believe we can deliver inhibitors uh, across the, the cyst wall to get to where the dormant parasites are. Our hypothesis is that peptide-linked morpholino oligomers can be a robust and versatile, that's a key word, versatile approach against Toxoplasma gondii. That's our hypothesis. What we're essentially presenting is a series of proof of concept experiments. So we're not proving, we're not saying that, oh, this system is the answer to everything. We're just saying that this system uh, behaves the way we want it to work in Toxoplasma gondii. That's all we're saying. And uh, we designed three morpholino oligomers specifically against fluorescence in fluorescent parasites, against luminescence in luminescent parasites, and against DHFR, which is a known essential target. So uh, inhibiting fluorescence, inhibiting luminescence, and inhibiting a known essential gene. That's the proof of concept experiment that I'm going to present. So first, we're going to inhibit fluorescence in these fluorescent parasites. And the, um, before I show you the data, I just want to say that these are scientific results, so they're going to be controls. But I'm not going to bore you with 
the controls today. So um, I'm just going to present you with a take home message from each slide. All I want to show in this slide is that when you add in the drug, you see a diminishing amount of fluorescence in comparison to uh, the absence of treatment. That's the take home message from this slide. Ignore like this second row right here. And um, so how do we actually create luminescent parasites? Well, we actually took the gene responsible for luminescence in fireflies and just stuck it into parasites. And so we create luminescent parasites. <laughs> and ignore all of these numbers and gibberish on here. Um, the take home message from this slide is that you saw a diminishing amount of luminescence and it has no toxicity on parasites and no toxicity on the host cells. Because remember, we're not killing the parasites at this point. There should be no toxicity to the parasites. We're just reducing luminescence in the parasites. So that's the take home message. No toxicity to parasites, no toxicity to host cells. And lastly, we are inhibiting DHFR, which is a known essential gene in parasite. And Again, the take home message from this slide is that no diminish of uh, no reduction in DHFR expression when there's no treatment, and you did see a reduction, significant reduction of DHFR um, in, uh, in parasites with the drug treatment. So we've knocked down fluorescence, we've knocked down luminescence, and we've knocked down DHFR in no essential gene. So that was our proof of principle experiment. And before I move on, I just want to point out, and I know I sort of scared you at the beginning um, by this idea that there are worms and bugs, you know, swimming about in your eyes. But I just want to, you know, take a step back and admire how beautiful they are. <laughs> um, so when they replicate in cells, they form these flower petals. And we actually give, it, we actually give these petals a term. Um, we call this a rosette. Uh, so that's a technical term that we use in biology, a rosette. So they can be very beautiful. So, so far we've, you know, solved two problems in treating toxoplasmosis. We were able to apply this system to identify essential targets. We knew that fluorescence was not essential. We knew that luminescence was not essential, but we knew that DHFR was essential. And it was largely non-toxic, which is good. So we've solved two problems. But how about the physical barriers imposed by the locations of the parasites? So we have to deliver inhibitors across ocular membranes to get to where those parasites are replicating. And how about the cyst wall and those dormant parasites that I was talking about? And these challenges remain unanswered. So we link the morpholina oligomers uh, to these green fluorescent probes we know where, the, where these oligomers actually go. And um, we created these eye patches and we put them on rabbit eyes. And we stained the back of rabbit eyes uh, and so we saw, uh, we knew exactly where the, 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 the retinal and choroid region are. Um, and so, and then we watched where those fluorescent probes went and uh, those morpholina oligomers went all the way back to the eyes. So there was this cross-section of uh, the retinal region at the back of the rabbit eyes. And how about delivering inhibitors into the cyst? Um, so we used those exact same morpholina oligomers. We treated a cyst with hundreds of dormant parasites inside, and we saw we saw the green fluorescent probes went all the way into the cyst. So we've solved the four main problems associated with toxoplasma, treating toxoplasmosis. And we believe that this system is a good molecular target validation methodology. Um, it is an effective antimicrobial delivery method, and it is a potential treatment of toxoplasma gondia infections. Thank you. Any questions for Bo? You mentioned that the, there's versatility in designing these ligamers, and I'm assuming that that has to do with the peptides that you bond to them, and what sorts of um, peptides do you find are better for certain targets, or which ones do you choose to use and why? So, um, 
in order to inhibit like a target, you have to know the target's RNA sequence, and we do for pretty much all of the genes in human because of the Human Genome Project. So that's the advantage of this system, is that you can inhibit anything uh, as long as you know the RNA sequence. And I try to like stay away from the technical aspects. Um, but the important thing is that if you know the RNA, you can design a complementary sequence against that RNA sequence, and you can inhibit uh, that particular target. Any more questions? Thank you, Bo. You explained a very complex process very simply for a non-science person, so that was really clear. I'm just curious, um, for, I think it's really interesting that it's um, found so often in cats. <laughs> um, and so I was wondering, are there um, like preventive like measures to prevent your cat from getting this? This is perhaps a bad question, but it's just interesting because that's, you know, has to be one of the most popular pets and, you know, at least in the United States. So it's amazing to me how prevalent this is. Um, this is fascinating. Well, I mean, as a parasitology, I normally dissuade people from owning cats. Um, and because, I mean, th there's a reason for making that recommendation because if we look at all of the countries with the highest percentage of people with toxoplasma, it's Latin America and South America and France. And we know why French people have toxoplasma. Um, but for Lat if we look at Latin America and South America, the reason why they have a high percentage of population with toxoplasma is because they have the highest number of cats per 100,000 people. So um, my recommendation would be not to own any cats. Um, <laughs> but if you happen to have you know, cats at home, uh, my recommendation would be to um, not or prevent them from actually going out because um, toxoplasma is actually very prevalent outside um, because, because of the cyst formation, they can withstand very harsh living conditions. So they can survive in ditches, they can survive in you know, river cam and like everywhere basically. And so my recommendation would be to prevent your cats from going outside. <laughs> If you, uh, if you already have Toxo, is it then okay to have cats? <laughs> yes. <laughs> and how can you test that? Um, it's a very simple urine test, actually. And um, they normally do these urine tests um, right after when you see your like, gynecologist or like any, it's a very simple test. And they normally do it on all pregnant women. Yeah. So once, so I, I want to reiterate that it's only a problem if you um, don't have toxoplasma, and then you get it when you're pregnant for the first time. You get it for the first time while you're pregnant. Yeah. Well, oh, very nice talk. Um, I was wondering, are there other pathogens that use a similar sort of cyst mechanism of protecting themselves, and could your strategy work against them? Well, um, I know there are a lot of uh, parasites that do that. I don't have like a specific examples right off the bat, but um, one of the reasons why I decided to study parasitology and or eukaryotic cells and not prokaryotic cells in general is because these eukaryotic cells are so much more immunologically interesting because they have learned to do all kinds of tricks. So I know parasites that, um, that live in grasshoppers, for example, and they need, to, um, uh, uh, they need to be in water in order to survive, in order to uh, complete their life cycle, their latter half of the life cycle. So what they do is they make the grasshoppers drown in water. So we're seeing some really unique tricks coming out of these parasites to get what they want. Um, so I don't have a specific example in these like cyst formation or cyst development, but I can point to um, all kinds of behavioral manipulation that these parasites do. Well, there's nothing, it's not, 
um, it doesn't adversely affect the pregnant woman herself, but it would affect um, her fetus. Uh, through the placenta, it's congenitally, so it would be passed through the placenta um, into the fetus. And um, I just want to point out that, so if you get toxoplasma like three to four months before you're pregnant, then you would develop antibodies against toxoplasma. Then your fetus or your like, infants would be fine. But it's only when you get the parasite for the first time while you're pregnant. So it varies. Um, it varies depending on what stage you actually get the parasite. So if the fetus gets the parasite at the beginning of the, the, the beginning of the trimester, then it's more serious. So you get you might end up like getting like um, you might um, you might get like mental retardation and other uh, serious mental problems. Um, but and because I work at the University of Chicago Medical Center, and we actually have we run the only toxoplasmosis clinical study. And we saw some really interesting, um, really interesting phenotype, really interesting uh, symptoms uh, for those patients who got toxoplasma at, uh, just right before birth. Um, they tend to be high achievers. They tend to be very high achievers, and they tend to, you know, go to like very prestigious top schools with high, you know, like amazing academic records, and so. Like it's very, it's just very interesting span of disease phenotypes. You get, you know, like mental retardation if you get it at the very beginning of, you know, you know, pregnancy, um, versus those who get the parasite at the later part of pregnancy. Wow. Yeah. Thank you. Um, so, what are you going to do next? Well, so um, this project is actually very different um, from my current project um, in Jim and Joe's lab. And my, because I work with a medical doctorate um, back in Chicago, so her approach to biology is very different from my current supervisor, who's a PhD. So, he approaches uh, medical problems from, or the biology of the, the parasite from the purely scientific perspective, so from understanding uh, the, the invasive mechanism, for example. So that's what I'm working on, understanding the mechanisms of invasion. Yeah. <laughs>